uh, Hotel Juarez is, is my third collection of stories, but I don't call it a collection of stories, I call it stories, rooms, and loops. And I guess the reason why I do that is because as I was writing it, as I was putting it together, I realized some of them weren't stories, some of them were just images, or some of them were just kind of connections to previous stories that maybe on their own didn't make much sense, but that when you read the entire thing, perhaps one image might take you back to the next, like loop back. I kind of see it as a, a hotel. <laughs> That's Hotel Juarez. And you went to the hotel and there's the lobby and it's all friendly and there's a guy at the front desk. But then it's a hotel in Juarez, the most dangerous city in the world at the time of the writing, according to the London Times. There were murders after murders and even the cops weren't safe there. So it's really kind of a scary place. So the hotel, you know, you walk into the lobby and it's kind of, you know, well lit and you think maybe you could stay there. But then you start walking down the halls and you hear voices in the room. And I kind of wanted it to be like that. Some of them are just hallways that might connect stories in some way, and then others you enter a room and there's an actual story going on. Maybe a man and a woman are, you know, playing out a drama or something like that. Well, I moved to California to El Paso, and suddenly I found myself living on the border, and I loved it. I would cross over to Juarez all the time, and Juarez to me was always a place of the imagination. If you ever walk through Juarez at night, uh, it's kind of like right out of the Bolaño novel, that kind of imagery. I mean, it's just incredibly a dark place, and there's a lot of things going on, and there's drug deals going on, and there's, and I used to walk all night in Juarez. I would, I would go there at midnight after hanging out with friends and walk the streets, and I didn't care. I mean, it was probably incredibly dangerous back then, but I just was too ignorant to know it. But then the drug wars got there, and suddenly Juarez became known as the most dangerous city in the world, even even cops were afraid to, to be in Juarez. And it affected me as a writer. It affected me as a writer. And, but I, one of the things that I began to realize as I'm writing these stories, um, you know, that many of them set there, is that um, having come from California, specifically having come from Fresno, and having come from a very violent part of Fresno, and Fresno probably was, it was the murder capital of California for many years. Uh, proportionally, it had more murders than, than any other city, except for East Palo Alto, strangely enough, which is a very small body of right, right, right near Stanford University. But, uh, you know, I grew up around that violence, and I found that there was a lot of connections between my past and connections between Juarez, and the book just kind of came together after, you know, 10 years of compiling stories. And uh, I think I needed Juarez in order to connect me to Fresno. I needed Juarez, I think, in order, in many ways, it connected me to my past. When I was a young writer, just starting out, hadn't even had my first book contract, but I was trying, I was sending stuff out. I was an instructor at a college, and I had a few things published, and other instructors kind of knew who I was, so they invited me to do a reading, and headlining was Bursiaga. Jose Antonio Burciaga, like one of my heroes, right? Because, you know, as a Chicano writer, he's one of the first ones we've ever read. That Drink Cultura image of his that looked like the Coca-Cola was an iconic image among Chicanos. And uh, so everybody had heard of him. And I was like starstruck. I was awed. And that night, he was telling an auditorium of a thousand students that he found out he had cancer. And it just kind of blew everybody away because it was, I think, one of the first times he spoke about it publicly. You know, maybe he had done it before, I don't know, but it was the first I had heard of it. And it was when Spill the Beans, uh, he was promoting Spill the Beans, I think, which was, I, it might have been his last book. And uh, I went up to him afterwards and got a chance to talk to him, and he signed my book with big markers, and his, his signature itself was a work of art. And ever since that time, he was so humble, he was so nice, and, and it's as if he knew he was dying, but he just still had this incredible amount of love to give the students and to give to me, a new writer. He was very encouraging and complimented me on my work. And, you know, when you're a young writer, you want to believe everything you hear. And I completely believed him. Here's one of my literary artistic heroes telling me that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do well. And, and I completely believed him. And uh, he, he was right in a sense. I did okay. Okay. <laughs> 